Hello, everyone. I'm just going to let people funnel in real quick before we get started today. Um, thank you so much for joining us on this Friday. We're going to let a few minutes um, before we get started. Um, so thank you. Some more people funneling in. We'll just start in one minute. Thank you all for your patience and joining us on this Friday. All right, well, I'll start kicking us off with some introductions. Um, I am your host, Katie Zweifel, and I'm with Tessellation and Data Coach. Um, just a few housekeeping items before we get into today's presentation. If you have any questions throughout um, Phil's um, presentation, please use the Q&A module. This way we're able to check and make sure we do not miss any questions that may be lost in the shuffle if you use the chat. Um, Phil will be happy to answer any questions at the end of the presentation as well. Um, please use the chat fun function to introduce yourself. Um, we would love to know your name, where you work, and what position you hold. And this is just a great way um, to network. Feel free to drop your LinkedIn profile in the chat as well. And just be mindful to be respectful to one another and have fun during the webinar. All right, before we get started, we have a quick message from our sponsors, Tessellation and Data Coach. Tessellation is a modern analytics consultancy. We enable and manage organizations, analytics, and self-service teams by educating people, optimizing technology, developing world-class products, and providing sustainable results. And Data Coach, where most analytics training programs lack depth, Data Coach provides wisdom. Our modern curriculum is unparalleled, compro comprising video lessons, hands-on exercises, and a capstone project design around your company's data. Data Coach also offers a truly premium service, one-on-one -on -one coaching. I'd also love to introduce our speaker of today's webinar, Phil Perrin. Phil Perrin brings a decade of analytics experience into the human resources sector of Tessellation. His background has primarily been with developing KPI dashboards with Tableau for ex executive leaders, but has also built an extensive solutions with custom geographic components. He has also designed strategic organizational dashboards using Power BI and Google Data Studio. For Phil, building out a comprehensive data model is immensely important to any analytics solution. He has built a strong background in using Alteryx SQL and also works with Python and R. When possible, the solutions that Phil creates will incorporate advanced statistics combined with intelligent design to make the insight as actionable as possible. All right, without further ado, Phil, please take it away. All right, thanks so much, Katie. Um, I'm going to assume that people can still hear me and things are working well in that front. Um, let me share my screen real quick. So that's this one. <clears throat> so, Thanks for joining today. First thing I wanted to say is this is the session Beginner's Guide to Using R in Tableau. Um, so if you're expecting anything else, well, you're, you're sadly in the wrong meeting, um, but we fully welcome you here. We love seeing you and, and hope you'll have fun uh, while you're here. So um, before I get started with everything, I do wanna make three quick points. Uh, first of all, Tableau Conference just wrapped up. So if you haven't seen any of those sessions, be sure to go check those out. I know there's a few I wanna check out. Uh, I always love the devs on stage piece. So, um, you know, hopefully it's, it's as insightful as it has been in the past. I still need to go uh, watch that. Secondly, yesterday was Veterans Day um, and it's still not too late to thank a veteran for their service. Um, in fact, any day of the year is probably good. So be sure to do that if you see um, or, or know a, a veteran out there. And thirdly, uh, as I just mentioned to Katie, my, my mom's visiting in town. She's over in the other room and um, she's just a super cool lady. So maybe when you're done with a webinar, you just wanna pick up the phone, give your mom a call and say, hey, uh, thank you. Um, and that's, that's you know, always a good thing to do. So um, with that, I guess we'll jump in. 
<clears throat> so what are we going to be covering today? So I've broken this out as sort of like a book here. We've got a prologue where we'll talk a little bit about why. We'll go through three little chapters uh, talking about setting up our environment, doing a basic t-test, and then doing some regression analysis. And then finally, we'll talk a little bit about the um, application and next steps. So where you can go with uh, using R in Tableau. So prologue, why use R in Tableau? Um, as mentioned in my little bio there, which Katie, thank you so much. That's super, super flattering to hear all those nice things. Um, one, dynamic data processing. You know, life is too short to work with static data sets, so let's make those as dynamic as possible. With the power of R, you can go way beyond uh, what the calculations and functions are in Tableau, as evidenced by some of the things that we'll be talking about, like t-tests and regression models. Uh, it gives much greater level of interactivity with your visualizations. I know some people make really awesome um, artistic visualizations. I tend to skew a little bit more in how can we remodel sort of the data on the fly? How can we take the data that we're working with and actually morph it into something else uh, based on what our changing needs are? And lastly, you know, typing formulas like that thing down there, uh, kudos to you if you know what that is showing. Um, typing that into a, a Tableau calculation just isn't fun. So there are way easier ways to do things like a t-test when you start interacting with Tableau and integrating that with R. So target audience for today, you know you're in the right spot if uh, this top half here applies to you. Maybe you know a little bit about Tableau and some things about R, or you know R and you know a few things about Tableau. Uh, <clears throat> and you also have a basic grasp of statistical analysis. Now, one of the things I point out is that I typically use R for statistical analysis and Python more for um, like web scraping or things in the operational side. Um, so that's, that's sort of my bias and, and my background on how I use R. And I mentioned R and Python because those are the two domains where analytics extensions in Tableau uh, have built in and have for quite some years now uh, had built in connectivity. So that's uh, just something to be mindful of there. Uh, the session, I'm not going to teach you how to use R. I'm not going to teach you all the ins and outs and nuances in there. Um, and I really hope you actually already have an understanding of how table calculations work in Tableau. That's because everything that we pass through to R and get back uh, from the R serve connection, uh, it, it lands back in Tableau as a table calculation. So if you're not familiar with table calcs, I recommend um, you know, reading up on those and making sure that you're, you're really familiar with that. So chapter one, environment. So if you're starting off on your R and Tableau connection journey, uh, definitely download, start up and, and get running with R Studio. It's super great, um, a really intuitive interface. And as we'll get uh, more details on at the very end of the presentation, there's a lot of great training packages out there that are nested right into R that you can use to help learn and figure out how R works um, and things like that. Next after R Studio is getting running with R Serve. Um, R Serve is a library that you can then install right there into R. Um, or our studio, and it allows that connectivity, um, much like Apache or even LAMP or XAMPP or anything like that. You can use our serve. Actually, its its sole purpose is to serve as a server specifically for R. So how is how does that module then send and receive data um, between the R engine and whatever you're working with? So. With that, let's get into Tableau real quick and set up some environment worksheets on a dashboard. And come over to the right piece here. So <clears throat> you may have seen the slide there in the background for a second. Why are we talking about setting up an environment um, 
in our dashboard. For me, it's really important to understand more about the environment that I'm actually working on because unfortunately there can be a lot of confusion since it's not actually very apparent what packages are loaded, what data objects are loaded, things like that. So I like to have an environment uh, dashboard in my workbook that tells me what's going on with the R server um, connection and how I'm interfacing with it. So the first thing we'll do is in Tableau here, we see that I've connected to a very basic uh, data set here called start. And what I've got here is sheet one with value and sheet one one with value um, on there. And so this is super basic. And I'll tell you a little bit more about this here in a minute. Um, all this really is, is a cross join between uh, a thousand records of the term value, which is just numbers one through 1000. And here you see the join here where I've just joined the number one with the number one. So everything's all joined together. We now have two fields creating a million records, super basic and easy. And we're very, we're only going to tangentially uh, touch those data pieces on here. Everything we'll be doing will actually be importing from R in a moment. And I'll show you about that in a second. So as I mentioned, the first thing we need to do is set up our environment. And what I like to do first here is create, well, before we do this, I, I almost forgot. Um, you, I assume with you being here, you've already seen the many, many videos out there. But in the case that you haven't, um, to connect to R, the very first thing you do need to do is when you've opened up Tableau, you go to your help uh, file menu here and go down to settings and performance and go down to manage analytics extension connection. You click on that. And what you'll be presented with is edit the R serve connection. So this allows you to uh, connect to R and R serve. Now, before you start connecting to it, the first thing you actually do need to do is get R serve running. So R serve and what this looks like. And as I mentioned, you know, having R Studio up and running is really simple. Um, as I said, all you do after you get R Studio running is you need to install R, or excuse me, R Serve, <clears throat> and just load that in. And I'm not going to actually do that right now. You would just click install, and there you would have it. Since I already have it here, I'm just going to go library. R serve, and that makes sure it's loaded. Um, so over here, there would be a check mark, um, which there is right now. And the next thing we do is connect to R serve. And as you see, all R serve does here is it starts up a program called R serve.exe. And that's something that's interesting that some people do actually don't realize. R serve is actually an executable program on your computer that runs. It's it's actually not a piece baked into R Studio or R itself. It's actually an executable program, as I mentioned, that serves as a server that allows inflow and outflow of data and processing. So now that we have that server set up, we can then connect to our local host instance by typing in local host here and port 6311. Um, I will be having some more blog posts coming out in the future about setting up a remote R serve instance. I use Google Data Studio, um, or excuse me, Google Cloud Platform to do most of my server work. And I'll walk through how to set up an R serve on a Linux machine in a remote environment. But for now, we'll just use uh, the local host instance here. We can test the connection. And yay successfully connected to the analytics extension. That means that our Tableau interface can now send values back and forth to R uh, in order to do some of that processing that we're look interested in. And then click save and can close. So getting back to our dashboard here and setting up some of these environmental variables. First thing I wanna do is create a calculated field. If you're not familiar with calculated fields, you know, then you know there's probably a little bit more work that you need to do in Tableau to get familiar with that. But creating a, tab, a calculated field for Tableau um, 
using script functions are a little bit interesting. Um, they require the first part of the script function is the actual code that you want to execute. And after that, you then input all the arguments that you'll be passing into that code. That way it's dynamic. So the first thing I'll do is create a script using a string uh, command here. And I have this already written up here. And we'll call this one version. Now in here, let me make that a little bit bigger for you. We see that all we're doing is using an R command here called version. <clears throat> and we want some extra information in here about the machine and the working directory. So I'll click apply. And now we see that I have a calculated field over here called version. As I mentioned, everything that gets passed in and out of Tableau uh, when using this um, extension is a table calc. So it's helpful to actually bring in uh, a, a value that you'll be operating on. In this case, I'm just going to bring in this value of one through 1000 um, to show you, you know, how it actually processes. I'll bring version over here onto text. And we see that R <clears throat> has computed some information here about this. We see it says R version 3.63 machine, laptop, and the working directory. And it says my working directory is C colon users Philip OneDrive documents. I'll show you in a moment how we can change that so that we can restructure where our data is coming and going from. So that's one piece. The next piece I'm interested in is actually uh, understanding what packages are, are currently loaded. So we'll create another calculated field. We'll call it packages. I'll click OK. And the same as before, I'll drag this over here, put packages on here. And now, instead of seeing the same information repeated over and over and over, what we've actually done is created a list of each of the packages that are currently loaded in my R environment. So we see YAR, Circleize, et cetera. So the question is, why is it doing it differently here? Why are we getting something different on each line as opposed to over here? Well, that's because we're using table calcs. So if you remember, a table calc will be taking the input each time and running through what's in there. And if we go back to see what the package's um, script is, we see that I've passed along the variable index as the argument that packages will be looking at. So what that means is here, I'm looking at package number one, package number two, package number three, and so on. By default, my packages calculation is uh, by, it's going down, but I could change that to um, use value, for example. And in this case, it's going to be doing uh, the same exact thing as it was when going down, because each of these are going down. I could put this in reverse order, for example, and then I would get slightly different results. Or I could even do it by cell, in which case we'll probably get something really strange here because it's going to try and put everything into one. Um, so in, in each case, it's, it's asking for the number one instance in, e in each uh, load of the formula. So that's obviously not what our desired results are. So we'll switch it back to going down. Similar to understanding what packages are loaded, I'm going to do the same thing with what objects are loaded. Again, I'll start here, create calculated field. We'll call you objects. We'll zoom in a little bit there for you. Again, I'm using index as my argument that I'm passing on. And I'm just using as character uh, ls, which is the command to list our objects in here. I'll click OK. We'll drag this over here again by default. We see that we already have some packages loaded. And that's because 
Um, I've actually been doing some testing to make sure that today runs pretty smoothly. So we'll get to more details about how these packages are actually being used in a moment. Now, I mentioned these packages, or excuse me, these objects that are here. What if there's a situation where, oh man, I've got way too many packages loaded up. I need to get rid of them. I also like to create a quick and easy little function here that will allow me to clear out all of those packages that are on there. <clears throat> excuse me, I keep saying packages, I mean objects in this case. So we'll call this clear. And in this case, I'm doing a script bool. Uh, so this is just returning a true false statement. Um, and all I'm passing to it instead of the uh, index function uh, is the attribute of true. So that way, uh, we are always passing an argument that is expected for the type of formula that's being used. I'll click OK. One thing I need to do with this is also create a parameter for Boolean. I should have renamed that. Back to edit. And we'll call you. Show my parameter. And then I also need a calculated field in this case where. All we're going to do is uh, create a calculated field for this, which will be, what did I name that? Clear param. Uh, yeah. I can now drop this over here. I won't check true for right now um, because now I have everything uh, blank. And I'll leave that for a second. Now, the next piece, instead of going through more of a live build here with you, I'll just show you what the end result of this is by jumping over to my other workbook. <clears throat> what I've done is I've put my environment, my loaded packages, and my objects loaded here all onto a simple dashboard. Here, I also have the uh, drop down for the clear parameter, which is simply a Boolean. If I mark true, what happens on the actual worksheet where I placed that uh, formula field and then I refresh my data, what's going to happen is the R module uh, runs and then it clears out all of the objects that I've had loaded. This allows me to understand a little bit more about how the order of operations in terms of loading each of my packages takes place because um, when you're deploying a solution, you really need to make sure, okay, what is it that I'm doing and how will that impact my end users? So for example, if my end users start saying, hey, I keep getting errors, what's going on? You can then debug and look at what's going on with all of these pieces that are um, loading and how they're being manipulated and so on. And again, all I'm working with right now is a simple data set of that one through 1,000 cross joined to another set of one through 1,000. Um, we'll show you in a second here what happens when we uh, are actually <clears throat> working with some actual data. So in this case, we're going to start walking through an example. And I'll come back to my presentation slide deck here. <clears throat> T-test. So we've set up an environment. So we have an understanding of what's being loaded in terms of objects, packages, and we also have the ability to clear those out, which will be really helpful. Now we actually want to do something with our R calculations that we otherwise can't do if we are using Tableau alone. So let's do three quick examples here where we're looking at a, sample, a one sample t-test, a two sample t-test, and then a dynamic two sample t-test. So the first thing I've done is I've created a worksheet here and it has this formula called R load data. All this is doing is starting up a library called YAR and I'll tell you a little bit more about that in a little bit. And I'm creating a data frame uh, called pirates patch and pirates no patch, which is based on the pirates data set. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about what is going on there in a little bit. Um, again, this is a simple Boolean script and all we're doing is returning the value true on here, but 
as you get used to working with R and in, in Tableau, you'll find that all of this happens really behind the scenes. So we'll click OK. I can refresh this and return to my auto updates. It doesn't look like anything's happened here. In fact, all I'm still working with are those simple values. But in fact, if I come back over here to my objects, we see that I've actually created some new objects to work with in R. In fact, I've got this uh, one piece here called Pirates Patch and Pirates No Patch. I also have Out, which was used in a different formula. So we've now actually loaded our data. The next thing we'll work on here is actually showing what this uh, dashboard looks like. And what I was really interested in this case was evaluating the tattoo counts of pirates. Um, a little bit of a silly example, but you may find some applicability to your actual use cases here. As you see, I have some table calcs that are loading and being computed here. <clears throat> this takes a minute or two. And in fact, I've deliberately not followed some best practices when it comes to how you would structure some R. And that's so we can decompose the code a little bit more as we get into it. So in this case, we have our sample of 1,000 pirates. And we see a little histogram here of the number of tattoos. We see there are 81 pirates that have 0 to 4 tattoos, 283 that have 5 to 8, and so on. On average, pirates have 9.4 tattoos. Uh, again, you know, the applicability here to your business use case scenario might be something along the lines of, you know, we were really expecting to have this type of an impact or this number of sales from a new marketing campaign. Uh, so you have a specific number in mind that you need to test against. Well, in this case, a t-test can be pretty helpful because you need to know whether or not all of these, uh, in this case, tattoos on pirates, uh, were appropriate and were um, aligned with what your expectations were. So right now we're interested in seeing is six statistically different from the number 9.4. Um, you might be thinking to yourself, well, of course it is. It's six. It's not 9.4. Uh, but what about seven, eight? What about nine? Is a nine statistically significantly different from 9.4? And as I move my parameter up here to, let's say, 8.75, uh, we'll see that Tableau is going to compute those again. And we see that um, the results here that I've computed, the results suggest that there is a statistically significant difference at the 0.05 level between the average number of tattoos pirates have and 8.75. Well, let's go up to 9 and see if there's still a statistically significant difference there. And we see that there still is a statistically significant difference. That means even nine uh, as, a, as our hypothetical number here, our hypothesis uh, is different from, from that. And we're able to do this now in Tableau that we weren't otherwise able to without writing some really interesting uh, coding in our uh, calculations. We can then go up to 9.25 and see, well, is 9.25. This is where we start to see that there is not a statistically significant difference. And we're able to do that by running a t-test in Tableau. The next piece down here was, I was interested in understanding, is there a difference between pirates who have an eye patch versus pirates who don't have an eye patch? Again, a little bit silly, but I'm trying to keep this fun because sometimes people get really bored with talking about uh, our integration in Tableau. I don't know why, it just happens. Uh, your use case may actually be something like, hey, we want to know if our A-B testing produced uh, statistically significant differences and is one better than the other? Is one marketing campaign resulting in a different, uh, a pr different results than this other marketing campaign? Is one approach to time management among our consultants yielding statistically significant differences in the approach we have historically used. In this case, we have pirates with eye, eye patches having a 9.34 versus pirates without eye patches having an average of 9.6 tattoos. So again, nothing dynamic going on here, but we are still computing a t-test um, and it suggests that there is not a statistically significant difference at the 0.05 level.
And I can uh, get into more of the computations and calculations here in a minute. But before I do that, I want to show you one other example here where we're doing a dynamic two sample t-test. And in this case, um, I'm interested in, well, what about younger versus older pirates? Uh, do they have a different in a difference in the number of tattoos that they have? And oh, I'm burying the lead here. Um, I don't want it to start off at 40, but that's okay. <clears throat> in this case, uh, I've got a parameter here that allows me to dynamically change what this cut point is for what I'm considering old versus young pirates. Uh, so for example, if I set it at 33 and give the uh, calculations here a minute to recalculate. we see that pirates who are up to and uh, 33 years old, so 33 years old or younger, have an average of 9.422 tattoos. And we see the same distribution uh, mechanism that I've put in here, which is zero to four, five to eight, so on and so forth. Whereas older pirates, uh, those that are older than 33 years old, have, um, you know, this type of a distribution uh, looks similar, but how similar or how statistically significant um, is the difference between 9.422 and 9.472? In this case, we've identified that there is not a statistically significant difference here. However, I found that when we use a cut point of age 40, what happens here is, uh, and again, it just needs to recalculate here real quick. It takes a few seconds to send all of the calculations back and forth between our serve and uh, our Tableau environment, uh, in which case I'll briefly touch on saying, it's best to put all of your R code into one uh, script and then have it execute once. Uh, in this case, what I've decided to do is actually put everything in different pieces. That way, when I share the workbook with you later, um, you'll be able to tease out what specifically is happening with each piece of the formula. Um, we can talk uh, offline. You know, I'm happy to answer questions if you ever want to talk about best practices. And the results here say that young pirates have an average of 9.401 tattoos, whereas pirates older than the age of 40 have an average of 11.9. So is there a statistically significant difference there? Yes, our results here from our, t our two sample t-test uh, suggest that that is uh, a statistically significant difference. Uh, again, we've been running all of the formulas here in the background uh, on this data set. So, so the last thing I want to do before we move on to the linear regression uh, test is and da, 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 come back to my load data page where I have our load data edit. Oh, actually I put it into the other one. Yeah, that makes more sense. So um, I'll show you briefly a little bit how some of these parts were constructed. So initially what we have here is um, where we where we loaded the data, excuse me, in the background. And that really happened with our uh, accessing the library here and put it on, on here. Once we've accessed that, in the background of Tableau sits a data frame right now, um, actually multiple data frames, where a data frame essentially is a data set. However, we're not accessing it the traditional way that Tableau would be accessing it, which you would see up here. When you start connecting with R, R very much wants to work with data frames, factors, and vectors. Um, Tableau doesn't natively work in that type of way. Um, it works very dimensionally with the loaded data sets. So what is going on here is that Tableau uh, is keeping these data sets uh, stored in the background. And I'll pop over to my other data set real quick here and go to my environment variable. And I have this called version. 
Now on here, it's the same formula as before. However, uh, I do have what um, has been commented out here. And that's another feature too when you're working with R and Tableau is just like in uh, regular R scripting, you can uh, comment out your code in, in here. You just use the Oglethorpe, the hashtag sign. Uh, to make sure that it um, isn't read, isn't processed. So uh, that way. One thing I've done on here is I've actually changed my working directory. You see on here, we've set my working directory to my documents folder. And what I can do is change it by simply saying set working directory to my desktop. Next thing I'm going to do is uh, do this write.csv which is going to actually write the pirates data frame back to my desktop in the uh, pirates.csv file. So we'll open up my file explorer real quick and go to desktop. We see that there's no pirates.csv file here. Um, it's, it's not there. However, uh, and I guess I can keep that right there. We'll click apply here now that I've uncommented these. Click OK. And now if I come back to my uh, desktop here, we see that I have the Pirates data set. And I can open this up. And this might give you a better understanding of just how Tableau is working with uh, data in the background. We see I've loaded the Pirate data set back in here um, with everyone from Jack Sparrow and Blackbeard and uh, everyone else. So we know that our pirate data set has just been written from Tableau through R back to my desktop. So that's a really exciting feature. It, R comes built in with a write back function for your Tableau users. Um, you don't have to do anything else fancy uh, with a different extension or anything. So that's uh, a feature I think is, is pretty important to remember. Likewise with R, um, you can really do anything in there. I've seen people who have uh, made API calls uh, via R and you know, while they're processing data, they'll order a pizza from Domino's or, or whatever pizza place because you can do an API call right there in uh, your R frame. So uh, very exciting opportunities for you to leverage that function um, while you're coding and, and doing everything else in your R build. <clears throat> so, We'll come back to my presentation here, my, my little slide deck here. So what we've done real quick here is run through these t-tests where we did a one sample, a simple two sample where we compared uh, two groups of data and the dynamic two sample t-test. So again, the business case use here is how are you able to meaningfully differentiate between two sets of data you might be working with or in the case of a one sample t-test, how do you meaningfully differentiate between um, a hypothesis or um, a desired result state and uh, whatever it was you were working with, whether that be a marketing campaign or your um, output from a manufacturing line. Is there a statistically significant difference between the data set that you're working with and that hypothesis? So the next chapter we're going to get into is a little bit more complex, but it's a lot more fun too. Uh, this is where we're talking about some linear regression. I think in the, um, the advertisement or the, the write-up about what we would be actually doing today talked about a simple linear regression. Life's too short for that. So I did a multiple regression here and we're going to bring that into Tableau and visualize the results. Um, and this is where things can get really interesting with the power of what Tableau is able to do when combined with um, the R scripts that we're able to do. So why would we do this? Uh, we sometimes may need to predict a value based on multiple inputs. And the way we would do that would be through coefficients. So the coefficients that we'll be producing come from a simple linear regression model that allow us to predict how these variables interact with one another. And we'll jump over to this real quick. And oh, yeah, that's uh, I got a little error message there because Tableau tried uh, writing this file again, uh, but I already had it open. So 
uh, one thing that can be helpful when you're working with R and uh, writing these files might be actually including a timestamp, for example, whenever you're writing files. That way, uh, whenever you do it, you know that you won't be writing over or attempting to write over the same files that you were producing. So, and we'll make sure my uh, objects are fully loaded here. So now for the next example, we're gonna continue with the pirate theme. And my pirates, uh, they are out on the seas and unfortunately their Wi-Fi connections get terrible out there. So instead of doing what they had been doing, which was tracking Bitcoin and Ethereum and all other types of uh, cryptocurrencies, instead uh, we're sticking with diamonds. So we need a dashboard that tells our pirate captain about the diamond industry and what's going on there. So let's jump over to this dashboard here. And what I've put together real quick is a diamond modeling and value predictor dashboard. So this helps all of my pirate staff out there with understanding uh, the sale price that they need to compute and what factors are important when computing those uh, sale prices. <clears throat> so again, this one, because I very intentionally <laughs> didn't follow some best practices with keeping my um, formulas uh, more consolidated, what I've done is actually parse them out, and I hope that will make things a little bit easier for you uh, as the end user when you get this workbook to follow along and look at what was done and, and see the different pieces that were, that were done. In this case, what this dashboard is doing is actually I've um, created a, a linear regression here that shows us the observed value of diamond sales and what our model predicted value is on here. And we've actually predicted this based on three different values. So we've got weight, clarity, and color. And I'll switch color over to true right now. Again, I was just doing some testing earlier to make sure that that was still working. <clears throat> so what this is doing is actually taking our diamond data set, which much like the pirates data set is actually just in the background. It's not actually loaded in Tableau at all. It's just a data set that Tableau is only able to access when we're going through the R connection. Um, so what we're doing here is looking at the observed value as our dependent variable and our three independent variables our weight, clarity, and color. Our uh, graph here, our little line chart, uh, definitely not the best visual in any way, shape, or form, but it um, does give us a better overview of what's going on. So um, again, you know, the table calculations do take a little bit longer on this one just because of the number of computations involved. And there we have it. So we have the observed weight, which is on size, which makes sense. We have observed clarity, which I've grouped into high, medium, and low. It's actually a numerical value that I've then put into different buckets. And then we have observed color, which comes in a, a number between two and eight. Um, and so what we're, we've done here is we're looking at the average weight is 9.9, .9. the average clarity is one, and I believe in this particular data set, the clarity has been normalized to one. And then the average color is a 4.96. However, I believe it, given this data set, it's actually categorical. It just gives you a, a good understanding of where that is. Our uh, regression model here shows that you know, we do see this increase here uh, over uh, the observed values here, which are the values of the sale prices of these diamonds. And at the higher end, uh, I definitely see a lot of these diamonds. And at the lower end, I see a lot of these Xs, which tells me there might be something going on with this clarity here. High clarity diamonds are definitely selling for a lot more than these low clarity, as I think we would expect. At the same time, there's also a lot of these larger icons up here, which suggests that the weight or the carat of the diamond is uh, much more important to getting a higher value. However, I'm not seeing the same effect here um, on my graph as I would uh, as the other two characteristics. When I start looking at the observed color, yeah, I see seven and eights down here, but there's just so many of these four, fives, and sixes that it's really hard to observe what's going on. Again, the twos and threes are in here as well, but uh, it's hard to tell really what's going on. 
So when we've done our, our actual regression, I've got an output here where, again, I've typed up some results here that show that the overall model p-value is statistically significant. And the model appears to uh, provide a 63% explanation in the, uh, uh, the value of diamonds. So based on the regression model, I see that I've been able to compute the coefficients here based on the intercept, which tells us about the overall model, the weight and clarity and color. And unfortunately, it turns out that color is not a statistically significant predictor because our p-value is above 0.05. So one thing I can do here, and as we saw in the workbook a second ago, is we can turn off color as a predictor for our values. Um, it doesn't have a huge impact, as you can see here from the coefficient table. <clears throat> uh, it was only decreasing uh, the value by 0.4, uh, you know, 0.45 here for every increase in the, in the, for every change in the color. So it really wasn't doing a whole lot for the model. And as we can see, it was not statistically significant. As I've just removed it from our model, we see that my table here has, re has taken color out and we no longer have that in our model results. Um, so our pirates are now able to get a better understanding of what's going on in the diamond sales based on this sample data set. So now when they're out there pirating and looking around for what they should be uh, finding in, in for, their, for their diamonds, we know that, well, color might not be an accurate predictor component for our, um, for our uh, diamond sales. So now we come down here and ultimately this is what we were hoping to get to, which is how can we predict the value of diamonds? Um, we have input weight, input clarity, and input color. So now when a pirate picks up a diamond that they found on the shore, they uh, can type in, well, here's the carat, the weight of it, the clarity, and the color. In this case, because we've removed clarity from, or excuse me, we've removed color, it actually doesn't matter what I put in for color. I can put in eight here, and it's not actually going to change anything in terms of my output here. So based on this model with the evaluated predictors, a diamond with a weight of 9.8, a clarity of 1.2, and a color of eight uh, should have a value of $193. And that's a value that's been determined based on the, uh, the coefficients that our model produced here. So our intercept, um, weight, and clarity. Again, I can change our weight, which seems to have a really, uh, uh, really small but important aspect here uh, pertaining to the um, overall pricing scheme. Uh, but clarity really seems to be very important. So we'll change our clarity. Uh, maybe we found a, a pretty low grade diamond here and we'll put our clarity down to a 0.75. And <clears throat> that same diamond that was 9.8, but with much less clarity, uh, we see just dropped in price uh, from 190 uh, something there to $183. So that's how we're able to then use these beta coefficients in our Tableau dashboard to predict uh, model pricing here. And that is that on here. I'll take you into the actual graph here a little bit, since as a Tableau user, you're probably most interested in how you're able to visualize this. Um, what I've done under the hood here, and I wanna keep an eye on time in case there's any questions that come up. <clears throat> we'll let this compute for a second. So what I've done under the hood here, again, is use observed value and model predicted value to plot this regression model. Um, there are other options you can use here, like plotting residuals or plotting um, you know, anything that uh, is, is in your data frame. So an important piece on here is that I used uh, the same data set that I was using before, just values cross-joined. And then what happened was I loaded in my data frame in the background of Tableau, which is this diamond sales uh, uh, historical database, um, which is just a record of diamond sales based on color, uh, weight, and clarity. 
you see everything then uh, in here is all of my calculations in here. Most importantly here you see is, let me unhide that one, is the loading of the actual data set. So again, something that you're familiar with, what we were just looking at a minute ago, where we are loading that initial library for our Tableau dashboard. Um, and then what we have here, for example, is our adjusted R square value, um, where what we've done here is actually said, okay, give me a summary of the diamond uh, linear model and output the adjusted R squared. Something similar that you might see here is if we were to do, for example, um, well, first thing, okay, I do have uh, YAR loaded, so I can do uh, diamonds.lm, and that is going to be a linear model of uh, value by, and in this case, I'll just uh, show you briefly uh, how this might work. We'll say weight uh, data equals diamonds. Yeah. And so that produces our, uh, what you might be familiar with in R, which is this, uh, an object over here, diamonds.lm. And so if I do summary diamonds.lm, we see all of the results here that we would typically be familiar with in a, reg in a regression model. Um, in this particular case, what I was also interested in was not just diamonds LM, but also seeing specifically what that adjusted R squared value is. And this is how see, you would be able to access each of those pieces in here uh, is by calling them individually in your Tableau model. So, just R square, we see that it returns a value of 0.3619. Um, and that's how we're able to then use this, this type of value back in Tableau is by first running our model. Second, uh, we can then summarize it. And then third, when we do a summary, we need to specifically return a specific value that we're interested in. And that's how we're able to then use those values in Tableau. So we'll come back here. And in this case, that adjusted R squared is, is how we're able to um, show what that um, model predicted uh, component is, the, the explanatory component. Again, I'll be able to share uh, this workbook and uh, provide a few more context notes for how this all was put together. So for example, I have all my predictor components here, which is predicted clarity, predicted color, um, the predicted value and weight, for example. I also did some testing around to see if plotting this based on a rank order of the observed value was more uh, or less of, of importance to the end user. In this particular case, this might be, you know, hey, we have, uh, we're tracking all of our sales with specific clients and we want to build out a model based on the average sale price for specific uh, components that we're selling. So does our observed value fit against a model predicted value um, in terms of what we're selling to specific clients or general population and so on? And it might be able to help you better understand your pricing components and what features are important to your end users, um, or not your end users, but your, your customers or clients. Your end users might actually, in this case, uh, in, in my case, it was a set, a set of pirates who are out there looking for diamonds. In your case, it may specifically be a sales team who's trying to better understand, hey, how should I actually do the pricing for this given the uh, components that we're working with? And much like on this dashboard, you can include any number of filters to then adjust what you're actually running your model against. So for example, uh, maybe I know, oh man, those last 10 diamond sales, those were, those were way off. They shouldn't be included at all. So I'm only going to include um, 140 of my uh, 150 diamond sales here. So um, We'll quickly recalculate this based on 140 diamond sales, and in which case everything on our, our page here will, will shift slightly in terms of what the averages are, what the results table look like, and then even how our coefficients can determine 
a better pricing model given the inputs that we're interested in. Again, I'll let that run here for a minute. And then we'll close up here with some final comments and recommendations for future reading. Again, what if if I had put all of this into uh, a more streamlined formula uh, process, it, it does run quite a bit quicker. And in fact, uh, a best practice I'll, I'll let you know about here, as this was a beginner's course, uh, hopefully um, it, it got you a little interested in, in using our calculations in your Tableau workbooks. But uh, an example approach you might use is actually having parameters on one dashboard so then your end user puts those in without having to load any of the formulas. You then have a computational dashboard uh, that you then lead your user to, which runs all of the calculations and in the background. And then as a third and final step, you then have your final dashboard, which actually visualizes the components. That way, no end users are actually making changes like I am on the fly, all on the same workbook. It will slow down exp the experience a little bit. It's, it's much better if you separate out that, that process there um, where you're, you're allowing your end users to do that in stages. So in this case, I've just used 140 of my cases instead of um, the full 150. So we'll come back here. And so recapping what we just walked through there with our linear regression, it's pretty straightforward, but as I mentioned, some of those calculations, uh, because they're all happening really in the background, it can be a little bit more of a, a meta type uh, thought process where you're thinking about this. So, Epilogue, recap and next steps. So we covered an environmental variables and why it's important to put that together so you, you better understand what environment you're working on. We saw how t-tests can help us determine if two values actually are different or if statistically they're close enough. And then we created a regression line based on multiple independent variables. I said I will uh, post this workbook online. I'm sure that will be going out early next week so that we can see that. And you know uh, some some resources here. Uh, we can share this out as well. The examples I use today are from a package that you can load into R called Yar, the Pirate's Guide to R. It really works through amazing tutorials on how to better understand and use R concepts in everyday analysis uh, using kind of a fun narrative and everything. I also recommend joining the data dev community if you're not already there. And finally, there's a really, really helpful Tableau community forum post uh, that has a lot of different resources on there. So you'll be able to check that out. So I'm not sure if we have any questions now. I didn't see any come up during the um, presentation, but I'm happy to address anything in the final couple minutes here that we have. Cool. All right. Well, as I said, thank you so much for your time. I really super appreciate it today. I hope you will uh, find some enjoyment in using R in your next Tableau workbook. It's really great for doing some statistical analyses. Um, again, Python will work very similarly and uh, can be done uh, in a similar kind of fashion, depending on your scripting preference. If you have any questions, I believe my contact information should be available to you. Um, and you can definitely check that out. Definitely uh, follow up with me if you have any questions. And I look forward to connecting with you after today. Katie. Thank you, Phil, for a fantastic presentation and all of you attending today. We really appreciate you spending a little sliver of your Friday with us. Um, as Phil mentioned, please do not hesitate to reach out to Phil or I on LinkedIn. I dropped our links in the chat. Um, we also um, sent out a link for our upcoming webinar next week as well, if you want to attend that. 
Um, anything, if you want to refer back to this webinar at a later time, the webinar recording will be emailed to everyone um, by Monday, as well as the workbook um, and the resources that Phil shared um, that was used in today's presentation as well. Other than that, that is all for today. Um, thank you to everyone attending, and we hope you have a wonderful weekend ahead. Thanks, everyone.